On day 22, the war in Ukraine continues to cause suffering and displacement across the country with no clear sign it is near any end. Despite British intelligence saying Russia's invasion has largely stalled, there was no respite for Ukrainians under bombardment. Shelling continued in the east, with Severodonetsk coming under sustained attack. Residential areas were again hit in Ukraine's two biggest cities, Kiev and Kharkiv. And there's still no word on how many casualties there are in Mariupol after Russia bombed a theatre being used as a shelter by hundreds of people. And you should be warned, there are distressing images in my report. If you want to understand how the war has changed Ukraine beyond recognition, watch this. Channel 4 News has matched images from before and after 22 days of war. This is Kharkiv. This is Borodyanka. This is Karazin National University. And this is Mariupol. At the theatre in Mariupol, where they had written children in giant letters so pilots could see, early reports this morning said most of those in the underground bunker survived, but it's feared some were in the building itself. It's almost impossible to speak to people in the city. A Ukrainian filmmaker, Artem, managed to send us this message. The Russian Dramatic Theatre, yes, it was called Russian Dramatic Theatre, was bombed by Russian airstrike. As I know, there were a lot of underground tunnels under the theater, where the civilians could escape the Russian airstrikes and artillery. There were no Azov base or any other Ukrainian troops headquarters. The Russian foreign ministry claims the theater bombing is fake news. Подрывы здания драматического театра, естественно, киевский режим сразу же попытался возложить на российских военных. Правда все равно пробьется. Мы сделаем все, чтобы эти преступления против человечности не остались безнаказанными. In the capital, Kyiv, another residential block took a direct hit from the country that doesn't bomb cities. They have no idea why this is happening to them. What have they done? As well as the one person killed here, three were injured. <laughs> President Zelensky went to hospital to visit those hurt. Yes, sir. Civilians, not soldiers. He was, of course, a star before he was president. But now his extraordinary ability to lead and communicate is clearly galvanizing his people. In the second city of Kharkiv, three people were killed and five injured when the market was attacked. The emergency team said the neighboring warehouse contained humanitarian aid before it was destroyed. And a nearby school was also damaged. This was home to Igor Gumenyuk. He and his family have now fled Kharkiv in fear and fury. Bombs fall almost every day. Houses were destroyed, people died. My family is safe now, but I'm not sure how long. There is no safe place in Ukraine. Both sides in this war hand out propaganda footage of their military strikes. Russia showed how it targeted warehouse buildings it said were military targets. And Ukraine showed how it is hitting Russian tanks. The Ukrainians claim there are now more dead Russian soldiers here than in the Chechen wars. The British government claimed the Russian advance has largely stalled on all fronts. If that's true, 
the bombs and missiles have not been stalled. Well, joining me now from the capital, Kiev, is our international editor, Lindsay Hilsom. Lindsay, what's the military situation there? Well, as you say, Krishnan, the artillery and the bombs continue, but the question is to what end? Because here in Kyiv, we're not seeing the Russians advance on the ground. And Western sources suggest that they are bogged down because they came down the road and they were very reliant on the road network. And uh, the, uh, the Ukrainians, who seemed to be pretty agile, were able to go round the edges and take out their tanks and their columns at the front and the back. Now, the Russians have been putting out propaganda video, and what it shows is them taking, they say, Ukrainian armour, putting Zeds, their, you know, their moniker, on Ukrainian tanks and armoured personnel carriers, and also showing the kinds of weaponry which they say that they have seized from the Ukrainians, including anti-tank weapons, which have been provided by both the British and the Americans. Now, there's no indication when or where these pictures were taken, but I'm um, you know, it may well be true that they're seizing this equipment from the Ukrainians. But the Ukrainians are also seizing equipment from the Russians. The Americans say that up to 7,000 Russian soldiers may have been killed so far. 7,000 in less than a month. Remember that 13,000 were killed in the entire decade of the war in Afghanistan. And, you know, from the Ukrainian point of view, they don't say how many of their soldiers have been, uh, have been killed, and I'm sure some have been killed. But also it's a question of who has been killed. It appears that up to four Russian generals may have been killed. Now, why are the generals in danger like that? It suggests that they have been put at the front, when in fact normally you'd expect the generals to be at the back. And that is also an indication that they have a lot of military problems in this war. So are we seeing more pressure on President Putin? I think there is certainly pressure on him to try and find some kind of solution, and that's why the peace talks are continuing and why the Russians appear to be taking it seriously. The other thing he's done is he's gone to the Chinese to ask if the Chinese will provide weapons. Now, according to Western sources, the Chinese haven't yet made a decision on that. But there's also a question for the Chinese. Although they would very much like President Putin to, to challenge the West, this is not looking good, and they may not want to associate themselves with this kind of military and diplomatic failure. So President Putin will have some very difficult decisions to make in the coming days. Lindsay Hilson in Kyiv. Well, earlier I spoke to the former NATO Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen, and I began by asking what he thinks Putin's next move will be. I think his uh, dream is to restore He's obsessed by that idea to restore the greatness uh, of the former Soviet Union. That's why he wants to establish a sphere of interest uh, in the territory covered by the former Soviet Union. So what should NATO and the West do about it? We should uh, step up our delivery of weapons, drones, uh, better air defences, anti-tank missiles and other equipments uh, for the very courageous uh, Ukrainian troops. So that's one thing, step up the military assistance. Secondly, we should stop all imports of Russian oil and gas. We should simply stop the financing of Putin's war. Right now, uh, higher oil and gas prices pour into his coffers and finance uh, uh, the war. So we have to stop that immediately. So Germany needs to stop immediately and the rest of the EU. But they are reliant on Russian oil and gas. I mean, they, they, they wouldn't be able to keep their lights on. Yeah, of course, it would be a big challenge. Uh, in particular, Germany, Italy, some other countries would be hit hard. So we have to solve that problem uh, in solidarity. The good news is uh, that uh, we could get more liquefied gas uh, imported to Europe to replace, I think, up to two-thirds of the piped gas uh, from Russia. We could also uh, use some of our storages 
uh, and uh, gas connectors uh, will allow gas to flow freely across borders. But there is no reason to hide. This will be a challenge. It will come at a price. But that price is very low compared to the suffering of the Ukrainian people, and it's tiny compared to the loss of freedom that will be the result if we don't act now decisively. But if you're right about Putin's motives, he's not going to stop just because Germany stops buying his gas. Well, I think if he does not have money to finance his war, he will have to, he will have to stop. Uh, already the sanctions we have introduced are very efficient. Um, uh, and um, we've, if, if they don't work, I, I think we have to strengthen the sanctions. And I don't see an alternative. Uh, the next step should be complete stop for the import of oil and gas, knowing with open eyes that we will have to pay a price for that. And what if that doesn't work? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I belong to a camp that thinks that we should not exclude any action at this moment. Uh, I, I think Western leaders have been too eager to exclude this or that action. Uh, I think it should be part of our strategy to keep Putin uh, in uncertainty on how we will react uh, under cer certain circumstances. It's a very brutal war. He has violated international uh, uh, law. He is a war criminal. So I don't think we should exclude any action. Mr. Rasmussen, thank you very much. Welcome. Well, within the last hour, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has been holding a press conference where he repeated President Biden's suggestion that Vladimir Putin is committing war crimes and warned China not to back Russia. Our Washington correspondent, Siobhan Kennedy, has been listening. Siobhan. Well, this comes on top, Krishnan, of President Biden's comments yesterday as he was leaving an event where he branded President Putin a war criminal. Today, he's calling him a murderous dictator and pure thug. Well, today, his Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, as you said, said in his comments not long ago that he personally, he personally, mind, agrees with that label and said for the first time that the U.S. is in the purpose, he said, of uh, investigating, documenting possible war crimes in Ukraine alongside other uh, groups and institutions. We will look at everything, he warned. Let's hear from the Secretary of State now. Yesterday, President Biden said that, in his opinion, war crimes have been committed in Ukraine. Personally, I agree. Intentionally targeting civilians is a war crime. After all the destruction of the past three weeks, I find it difficult to conclude that the Russians are doing otherwise. As he has done throughout this crisis, uh, Secretary Blinken warned about what he thought uh, President Putin would do next, notably the potential use of chemical weapons, which he said Russia would use and his excuse would blame on Ukraine to justify greater military force there. Now, we know that U.S. intelligence has thus far been pretty accurate during this war. The question is whether or not that would be a red line for the U.S. to uh, become directly involved itself. Well, Secretary Blinken did not go there today. He also said that the U.S. was becoming increasingly worried that China was considering directly assisting, he said, Russia with more military equipment, weapons and so forth for use in Ukraine. That will no doubt be front and centre of President Biden's conversation when he, tomorrow from the White House, is due to have a telephone conversation directly with President Xi of China. Uh, Blinken saying today that Biden is due to make very clear that China will bear all responsibility for any actions it decides to take. Siobhan Kennedy in Washington. More from here later, but now Jackie.